I'm your inner dream monologue and you're fast asleep. So I'll be quick. Great job using the Colgate Optic White Overnight Teeth Whitening Pen before bed. When used as directed, it gives you a visibly whiter smile in just seven days. So while I fly and talk to animals, you're removing teeth stains with ease. Sweet dreams. And when you wake up, keep on living life to the brightest. Colgate Optic White. Find it at all major retailers. This episode is brought to you by Bumble. Who says Valentine's Day is just for couples? Just because you're not in a relationship doesn't mean you can't get out there and live your best love life. That's where Bumble comes in. This February 14th, you can flip the script and give those relationshipers a friendly dose of FOMO. Say no to staying in this Valentine's Day and yes to more. More dates, more first kisses, more gossip for the group chat girlies. Do Valentine's your way. Date now on Bumble. Let me be your heart. All right, Matt, we have a return guest for possibly the most absurd song that we'll ever have to discuss. Is this a rare moment where in our pre, like the before we start talking, we're able to play the entire song? Yes. For the our, whole for our song. fine listeners here. We usually just get to play a snippet, but in this case, you get to hear the whole, the full experience. So nothing is left out of our conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and this one was specifically picked. This wasn't assigned after after he did such a phenomenal job on the good old days, telling us all about Jeffrey Dahmer facts and quoting ICP lyrics. We said, Lars, open door. Anything you want to talk about, it's yours. And he said, I want to talk about Let Me Be Your Hog, the 17-second song that was supposed to just be kung fu fighting in a movie. So, Lars, what is it about Let Me Be Your Hog that made you say, I've got to, I got to talk about this one on the pod? This song connects the... Um cultural Marxism of the Frankfurt School of Academics. It connects with the whole uh, pre and post web to commodification of culture and the interaction of the creator and the consumer. And it serves as a exam, a really good example of a diegetic piece of music that reinforces Al's place in pop culture and his fans ability to personalize his experience with theirs in terms of trying to manifest the heroic journey. And I'll give, I'll give um, sight why all this stuff is true. And also I sampled the record scratch at the end, at the, at the beginning of my song, Signing Emo as an homage. I don't know. If really? You know, but... Dude, are That's you the, kidding me? The Once Upon a Time. I, I know exactly the I know record the song. scratch you're yeah. talking <laughs> about. That's, oh. Once Upon a Time in the City of Los Angeles. Marty. I was, How did I, was I not know that about, <laughs> oh, that makes me, what a great way to start. Al, I, I didn't no do that. Your, lab, your label doesn't know that, Al. I didn't do that. But um, <laughs> my, I was in the studio with Mike Sapone. Scotty and, Brothers are totally chill. Don't worry. They'll be fine. They don't mind. I <laughs> said, Mom, mind. Can, can you please find the UHF CD in my collection and email me the the AIFF and I explained how to rip it while we were in the studio because I didn't have a high quality version. So thanks, mom. Oh, that's that's so great. I mean, well, that's I, first of all, just thank you right away. We didn't get to say proper thank you for coming back on our show because already you here you are with uh, bringing the, the only note I have for this that I wrote down in advance is I learned just for this episode that this was replacing what he wanted to use in this scene was the song Kung Fu Fighting yep. by Carl Douglas and could not get the rights at the last minute. And so they were like, we got to put something else here. <laughs> and this is what Al came up with to fill this moment where for people who don't remember, maybe it's the guy, it's the scene in UHF where the former owner of the uh, station is in his pool sitting in like a floaty tube. And this song is playing on the radio <laughs> when he gets the call from, uh, uh, our uh, antagonist. It was whose also name I'm right now. Uh, well, it was yeah. Uncle Harvey gets the phone yes, call from just right. whoever it was that he owed money to. This was the first original song recorded for this album before even the UHF title track. Al laid down. Let me be your hog in the studio. <laughs> uh, according, this is the first thing he recorded. Well, first original. He did the Money for oh, Nothing okay. Beverly Hillbillies, and then Let Me Be Your Hog, and then the next day came in and did the UHF. Uh, song interesting he knew what his priorities were 
I guess that does <laughs> like, sort of explain one quick thing, because we, we were speculating at one point about things like Gandhi 2, because Gandhi 2 got recorded really late. But if this was a first edition, then that means that th- the whole soundtrack thing must have come after the movie was shot. Yes. Right? Like, they must have, which means that the Gandhi 2 thing, just to go back to a previous thing we had talked about, Gandhi 2 must have been planned, and they must have just known they were going to record like a theme for this idea and they just hadn't done it until absolutely later. Like we had speculated well, it was, like, do they need to bulk out the movie in some way. I think the movie must have been done pretty much yeah, like it maybe was, in the editing room when they actually went into the studio to do all this. It was that he had three studio days. The first studio day was just dedicated to money or nothing money for nothing. The mm-hmm. second studio day was Let Me Be Your Hog in the UHF theme song. And then yeah, yeah the third day was Fun Zone, Gandhi Two, and Specialist City. And then he then it was like Four months later, he came back and did like Isle Thing and she the, drives yeah, like the crazy. Like parodies to bulk out the soundtrack. Yeah. Right, 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 right. So it's, it's, it is a very, this is the strange, without a doubt, the strangest album, I think, in Al's discography, just in the sense of it is all over the place with, yeah. with it. And I think, I, I am pretty confident our theory is correct that he maybe expected this to be a couple Al songs and then like a score from the movie or something. And Scotty yeah. brothers was like, Nope, you got to fill this out. This needs to be a feature length. Yeah. We need it to be full length soundtrack. <laughs> um, um, I just heard a story by the way of, did you know that uh, the lead singer of smash mouth, he was in a rap group called freedom of speech <laughs> FOS that was signed to Scotty brothers. And <laughs> the only, the only story he has about being on Scotty brothers is that one day he walked into the office and he saw the Scotty brothers throw an A&R guy down the flight of stairs and lock him in a car trunk. And when he asked what was happening, they said, this is not for your eyes, and then got in the car and drove away. Whoa. (laughs) So, you know, the guy from Smash um, Mouth is adding more credence to the theory that Scotty brothers was a little bit of a mob. And... (laughs) and, uh, (laughs) So that was the original singer, because that guy's not actually in Smash Mouth anymore, right? I yes. think he left. Uh, he Steve, left about two years Steve ago. Steve Harwell? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Was uh, Yeah, I mean, boy, do I have to look up Steve Harwell's <laughs> rap group, Freedom of Speech. <laughs> well, s- well, speaking of weird rap crossovers, didn't Brendan do a song with the guy, Ali, who did the Mario rap in the new Mario movie? Did they do Mr. Jones? I, had did, I did actually hear that, yeah. So that's yeah. a great, well done, Lars. A great uh, <laughs> little tie-in. Before Weedus... Brendan was in a group that was signed to a major label. They were signed to Epic, I think. They were called Mr. Jones, and they have a very fully <laughs> produced music video. I might did I talk about this on the show once? I know. I have this a, is brand a, uh, new information to th- me. They they made a music video in the 90s uh for a song called Destiny. That is a huge budget. It was it was directed by Mick G. Wow. Okay. So like big hitter of uh, pop music videos at the time. And Brendan's right there. Uh, he's not the singer. He's just playing guitar in this band, but he co-wrote most of the songs. And that group kind of fizzled out pretty quickly. It just didn't take off. And Brendan took the money he earned from that project and bought the gear he used to record the first Weedus record. Nice. Well, and, and but that the, guy, the front man of that group, yes, was involved in the in the Mario Brothers movie. What's the Weedus song? I did my dreams for someone. I for someone's dreams. <laughs> yeah, I, that's about there, making that record. That's exactly right. There's the uh, track two on the first Swedish record is called Sunshine, and that mm-hmm. is literally what it's about. The chorus of Sunshine is I was a jerk and I did the work for someone else's dream. I did uh, not, and that's and probably him, my favorite song on that album. And too. it's him talking about making this record for this other guy. Like he wrote a bunch of the material. Another song from that from the first Swedish record about that is the Hey Mister Brown, where he is talking about. Uh, wanting to get paid for his work <laughs> because they were really dragging their feet and paying him. He's like, I wrote all this music. I helped put it together for you. And then, hey, Mr. Hey, Mr. Brown, don't have a cow. And then Brennan saying, just compensate me. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the first Weedus record is is totally inspired by that. And yes, now that guy, I, I, it was all label stuff. Uh, Brendan and Ali like, are friends still. Like they They never weren't friends. Uh, it was all just record major label stuff, which was, uh, uh, you know, Brendan had many degrees of major label <laughs> struggle over the years. <laughs> this is just the first example. Yeah. So I do want to dive in to Let Me Be Your Hog for a little bit, but I also want to give a big old shout out to a person that we've shouted out on this show before. Uh, it's a listener who has a YouTube channel. Uh, Control Z is his YouTube channel, and we've dug around in there, and he does these punk covers 
of Al songs and Simpson songs. Uh, I believe at one point Matt and I were losing our minds over how good his cover of We Do by uh, from The Simpsons was. But mm. he drunkenly one day messaged our Instagram page <laughs> and sent me a track that was called Oink Oink Wink. And it was a two minute cover of Let Me Be Your Hog where he wrote verses to go with the chorus of the song. It. I love that. I will I, love I will that. play it at the end of this episode for amazing. sure for everybody to hear. But uh amazing. Yeah, delightful. <laughs> All right. Well, we should go back because because Lars clearly we've got a lot. We we just hit a three bullet point uh discussion here about this song. We gotta we gotta dive right into it. Let's do it. Do we need to All analyze right. the lyrics first? <laughs> We, do we want to take a look at these lyrics? Uh, I got, let me be your hog. Let yep. me be your hog now. And then in parentheses, snort, snort. Snort, snort. And then I said, baby, 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 record scratch. That's, that's, you know what? That's exactly what I have. <laughs> Our notes match up, Matt. Great job. <laughs> I'm your inner dream monologue, and you're fast asleep, so I'll be quick. Great job using the Colgate Optic White Overnight Teeth Whitening Pen before bed. When used as directed, it gives you a visibly whiter smile in just seven days. So while I fly and talk to animals, you're removing teeth stains with ease. Sweet dreams. And when you wake up, keep on living life to the brightest. Colgate Optic White. Find it at all major retailers. This episode is brought to you by Bumble. Who says Valentine's Day is just for couples? Just because you're not in a relationship doesn't mean you can't get out there and live your best love life. That's where Bumble comes in. This February 14th, you can flip the script and give those relationshipers a friendly dose of FOMO. Say no to staying in this Valentine's Day and yes to more. More dates, more first kisses, more gossip for the group chat girlies. Do Valentine's your way. Date now on Bumble. You've been lost in the woods for hours now, stumbling around in the dark. You come around the bend and see two people roasting marshmallows over a roaring fire. They see you coming into the clearing and gesture over to pull up a log. Welcome to Campfire Ashes. I'm Paul. And I'm Jess. Join us as we tell each other our originally written spooky stories around the campfire and then dive into the lore and legends that inspired them. Is it something that goes bump in the night? Is it something menacing lurking past the tree line? Or is it just weird and otherworldly? You'll find it here on Campfire Ashes. You can find us on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, or right here on the Geekscape Network. Is there are there any songs? So you said Kung Fu Fighting was not approved to be in the movie. Are there any other songs in the movie that Al didn't write or parody? Uh, there. So we were saying there's someone who's credited as doing the score of this movie. You know, and none of the scoring made it onto the soundtrack. Uh, unfortunately, it seems like that was just, um, uh, they just decided to put only Al stuff on the soundtrack. It was our best guess. They were like, well, let's just make sure everything here is Al-based things. So uh, there's really not that much. Um, we're coming up to, uh, this episode has not uh, come out yet, but uh, Generic Blues, there's another like Generic Blues song that pops up at the bar in the like the bars, you know, the scene where uh, um, uh, Al thinks it's over and he's at the bar and then they see Stanley on the TV and they realize that it's all still happening. There's like a, a song playing in the background that is literally like generic blues music, uh, but it was written by Steve J. And I think it's really weird that they had Steve J. write a generic blues song when then Al put a song on his record called Generic Blue. <laughs> like it could have easily switched. I, it's, it's interesting that Steve J. got the track on there. But anyway, for the most part, everything is uh, Al or the. Uh, scoring guy but, but there's no like monkey song or like random yeah, no nope, I, nothing I agree like that. with you I, I, Lars like that. it's so funny that you say that because until you asked that question I guess I didn't even think about it but like let's say in an alternate world they did get the clearance on kung fu fighting it would have stuck out like a sore thumb as this one random noteworthy song that everybody knows in the middle of a movie that has like no other needle drops anywhere <laughs> within it yeah, no, you're. It's absolutely true. If we're talking about needle drops, this movie has none. Uh, the, uh, the the only needle drop is the Money for Nothing music video that is dropped right into the middle of this movie. Well, wait, what do you mean needle drop? Like, like, like significant addition to a movie? Is that yeah, a like a term? like a notable pop song that just appears in a montage sequence or a background thing or something like that. There are really no other artists. 
songs. Yeah, I always classified it as like a needle drop is a song that you already know before you see the movie that they go. have inserted to add an element of like reality to the movie. Like Can't Hardly Wait is basically an all needle drop movie with like one exception. Like every or, single song is a pre-existing song that they just threw yeah. in so it felt like it was a party in 1999. Or as you just referenced the new Super Mario Brothers movie which for some reason does like take on me needle drops. Some strange needle in drops the, in that in movie. The, uh, <laughs> yeah. It, for Donkey Kong for some reason they thought take on me was the right choice. Anyway, sorry, another one of our classic tangents there. <laughs> well, you know, the first pers- this is interesting cuz you know how the 80s nostalgia is big and there's a new Turtles movie. Yes. Steve Barron, the Irish filmmaker who did the Take On Me music video, directed the first Turtles movie as well as Conehead. So they wanted to they knew Seth uh, Rogan was working on Mutant Mayhem. So they wanted to do a nod to the director of the Aha video. So that's another theory. Wow. I mean, it just it's all I, 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 whatever, however many 80s connections we can get in nowadays. That's really like there's a whole team of people who are doing that job. You know, I was wondering what you think of this, Matt. I saw this Amy Heckerling movie called Loser, and they had a needle <laughs> drop at the beginning. And you saw a World Trade Center like like months before it was no longer the World Trade Center. And I'm yeah, wondering, yeah, yeah. I'm wondering, what was that band of that needle drop? Because I knew the song. Well, it's funny because now that feels like a needle drop. But at the time, I think that was just, that was a, a moment there where people didn't uh, necessarily know that song. But yes, no, yeah. that was uh, that was a song uh, called Teenage Dirtbag at the beginning of the movie Loser. I mean, um, you mean the the song that the music video uh, was even inspired by the the movie in its entirety. So much so that people think it's from In American Pie. That that song. so much so that we <laughs> constantly get asked. How what it was like being in the American Pie soundtrack and how much we wish that we our song was in a movie that had a soundtrack because Loser <laughs> did not have a soundtrack. It had a, a Teenage Dirtbag 12-inch single uh, with a, a B-side by a group called Prozac. Does anyone remember the group Prozac? No. <laughs> Prozac no. are a Canadian no. like pop duo that had a song called Sucks to Be You. Oh, yeah. Is all, I know yeah, it's yeah. true. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, does, uh, so, yeah. a, a pretty, pretty dope uh, like uh, pop tune. I, they actually have some great records. I would recommend uh, Prozac. Hey, good uh, for uh, Al fans. Check out the group Prozac. Highly recommended. A uh, very, very fun uh, Saturday People uh, is an album by Prozac that I would recommend. There's a rapper named Prozac from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan who did a record with Mikey Clark, who did all the ICP records, and he's now signed to Strange Music Tech Nine, and he has a great song called "I'm the Hitchcock of Hip Hop." Hatchet yeah. chat. Like yeah. and subscribe. Hatchet <laughs> chat, everybody. Get on it. That is nice. Um, <laughs> so listen, I want to ask you guys about, can you guys tell me the difference between a diegetic needle drop and an extra <laughs> diegetic needle drop? It doesn't have to be a needle drop, but you guys know what that term means in cinema scoring? I do not. I don't think so, actually. <laughs> okay. There, I learned about this term because, have you guys ever seen the movie Troll 2, which is like the worst movie? Yes. 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 So you yes. know the scene where they're, uh, she comes to the trailer and they start eating the corn and making out? Yeah. Okay. So when he sees her on the on the monitor and then he opens the door and she's outside. Remember, that's like spoiler alert for people who haven't seen Troll 2. Anyway, <laughs> I, I was like, what? I, I Googled the song and I was looking on like TV tropes and it said, this is an example of a die, diegetic music. I'm like, what the heck? So I'm like, I better learn that word. Diegetic is any music that is in the scene to which the actors can listen. Extra diegetic is like on the soundtrack and the actors can't hear it. So that's a diegetic scene because oh. he's watching on the TV and he opens the trailer door and the music gets louder. So it's obvious it's not just piped through the TV. The music oh. is part of the story. The the characters are hearing the song same yeah. as the audience. Yeah, as I got it. Like, I got it. So like so like this is a diegetic piece of it's music. It's a diegetic piece. Oh, that's a great term, Lars. I like that. Is that I'm so, glad so to know diegetic that. okay, so in that case, diegetic needle drops, um, if I'm remembering this correctly, were uh, key in mumblecore filmmaking then, right? Because I believe mumblecore was that in all of that weird filmmaking stuff where it's like everything has to be within a reality. Part of it was also any music heard has to be heard within the scene of the context of characters listening to it. Like you can't have like external stuff. Or am I just saying nonsense and neither of you know what mumblecore is? Yeah, <laughs> no, mumblecore, like, uh, like, um, I think like Larry Clark the, does a the lot Duplass of the brothers that can yes, about the couch. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So like they, so you're saying they know the song and the yeah, song they is have to know. Yeah. They, the characters Here's have the to bar. be aware that there is music within the scene and not like music that only the audience is hearing. Um, and it, it comes wow. and you're right, Matt. It comes from the Greek term dia meaning through and Jesus meaning narration. So like, so like, so diegetic diegesis narrated through the characters. So 
this is an example of that. And it, this whole question of like, you know, UHF, I'm sure you've talked about this. It was a harbinger for the 2007 YouTube movement where like Chocolate Rain and like people who made songs in their bedroom suddenly entered the pop culture. And like mm -hmm. Al's uncle Harvey acts as a metaphor for this because he's like the gatekeeper who wins the TV studio at a game of poker. And he's example of the bourgeois everyman controlling the centralization of media. And it goes back to what we were talking about in the last episode about Manson and the record deal, right? Like the fact yeah. that there were these gatekeepers and like, yeah, I remember Matt, when we were recording Robot Kills, we were in the studio and we like discovered Chocolate Rain, summer of 2007. Yes. And we were like- That that dates that album really well. That's a great <laughs> reference for when we were making that record. Yeah, I do remember that. But the irony, here's the irony though, right? Like YouTube was, YouTube was the viral nature of media, right? Like even though Al makes, or George makes all of these amazing- copies of the TV shows and it saves them, they all have to be within a certain context. And that's why I wanted to talk about the cultural Marxist Frankfurt School of Philosophy and how this ties into this. Before we do, there's some supreme irony that this movie is like the harbinger of YouTube and the Web2 media revolution. And that exact revolution was what gave Michael Richards his come up and, and ended his career. <laughs> that's very true. You're, you're right about that. I also, I have to tie one other point in there because you were touching on something great that I had not thought of before. Uncle Harvey winning the studio and coming up and having all this money also has a really nice tie in like thematically to Money for Nothing, Beverly Hillbillies. Oh. The idea of like the, the lower class, middle class people suddenly being bolstered up or like knocked up there and like the weird uh, like... I don't know, like a class is that motion was, between classes and all that Is that, that why stuff. he was willing to die on the hill that he had to do a Beverly Hillbillies mix with some popular song? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that was I, the, yeah. I'm not sure if you heard our Money for Nothing episode, Lars, or any of the listeners. Check it out. It's a great episode. We have uh, Patrick <laughs> McDonald from Smosh on him for that one. But Al wanted that originally to be Beverly Hillbillies mixed up with Let's Go Crazy by Prince. And then when Prince said no, then he moved to Dire Straits. But like... He was dead set that there was going to be the Beverly Hillbillies and some 80s pop song. Yeah, and I just couldn't believe because I love the lyrical connection between Money for Nothing and Beverly Hillbillies. Like the, you know, like the poor people imagining going to the upper class. And you're saying the same thing with uh, with Uncle Harvey there. That's just a great little extra connection of uh, this like particular theme that seems to have been... Uh, of interest to Al at this yeah. time. Al loves the name Harvey also. And also Al yeah. just loves a Harvey. <laughs> he lo loves a Harvey. Because Harvey the Wonder Hamster was, what, four years after this? Well, yes and no. The song he was, started, but yeah. He started doing Harvey the Wonder Hamster on the very first Al TV in 84. But he never oh, recorded shoot. the song until 10 years later for Alapalooza. But that was just on Al TV. He would hold up a hamster and go like, this is Harvey. And then he was like, say hi, Harvey. And then he would just throw it over his shoulder. But the very, the I think we said this, the very first time he sings that song, it literally feels like he's making it up on the spot with this hamster in his hand. It, yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then Harvey became his co-host for the, Al, uh, the Weird Al show in 1994. Seven, I want to say. So, that sounds right. Yeah, he loves that right. he loves that that hamster named Harvey. Mm -hmm. Um, you guys are you guys familiar with the term of the the MacGuffin? I'm sure you guys know that term. Yes, yes. Yeah. So like the his his the station becomes a MacGuffin because it's like his chance to use his ADHD creativity to manifest his dreams, which is kind of like the main reason why everyone, all of us millennials and younger and older, love Weird Al because it's like, oh wait. If you love media and you're a super great consumer of it and student of it, you can like manifest your hero's journey. It's kind of the plot of Ready Player One, right? Yeah. Not to spoil it. Yeah, like, absolutely. And so, and so, like the, the the cultural Marxists were like this Frankfurt School of academics who made the point that the Marxist revolution never happened because mass culture and media somehow placates the populace so that they don't want to have a revolution. So like, there's all these subtle things that make it so you don't want to have a revolution. And Theodore W. Adorno, who was a very famous philosopher in the scene, he said, the culture, in the culture industry not so much adopts to the reactions of its consumers as it counterfeits them. Meaning that everything that keeps us 
um, placated to not have a Marxist revolution comes from yeah. the idea that like we are so beaten to death by how culture is Xerox and, and our only way to have agency in a capitalist society is to Xerox that culture and try to pseudo individuate. But really it's all within this like box that we can't exa ever escape. Right. And so like everything Al does as a success is an iteration of something else that's already happened in mass culture. But what makes yeah. this interesting is that like there's this critical consciousness that becomes part of the Frankfurt School of, of Philosophy, where Al realizes that it's the little guy versus the big guy, and that he's not just a passive consumer, he's alienated from this Marxist model, and he's trying to feed these false needs of the consumers, but doing it in a way that kind of undermines the entire context. And so, as Marx said, the bourgeois, whenever it has got the upper hand, has put it into all feudal, <laughs> patriarchal, and idyllic relations. And so George Newman becomes this like manifestation of this intersection of culture and proves that the Frankfurt School of Philosophers is limited and the cultural Marxism like can be obviated when you realize <laughs> that there is this agency to create like Gandhi too and all this, this stuff within the context. So it's an interesting example of like art as autonomy versus the capitalist co-opting and passive consumption and like how mass culture is social control, but when you wrest it from the hands of the machines and decentralize it, you can be successful. And so let me be your hog. Like people always talk about, <laughs> they talk about the bourgeois pigs, right? Like the fact that like Marx would always talk about, like you, you own the means of control, the means of production, right? But when you somehow insert yourself into that and like become like a, a cog in that wheel, it's really interesting because the character is not George Newman, it's Al, which underscores the whole like metaphor for his role in popular culture and like how he can be the everyman, but also be the disruptor. And, you know, in, in a way, yeah, it's not like a communist like theme movie, but you could tie in those ideas. So that's what that's what I was thinking. What do you guys think? Yeah, man, that's I was just gonna say that. Yeah, you took the word right out of my mouth. <laughs> That's what's up. No, dude, you are, as always, just a brilliant, brilliant person. Yeah, I won't uh, lie. I, I think we've gone about 25 minutes longer than we thought we were going to be able to get I, with I, Let Me Be Your Home no, that's, so far. I mean, <laughs> I, I think you're absolutely right. And something that we have talked about a lot on this show that we're going to keep talking about is I don't think you can ever underestimate how smart and how thoughtful Al is and a lot of the choices that he makes. Now, did he, uh, whether or not he consciously thought every single thing that you just said, <laughs> I'm not totally <laughs> sure, but I do think he is always thinking about these themes and absolutely the idea of UHF as a film and the overall concept of the, the, uh, the small sort of independent, uh, Institute fighting against the larger corporate money making, uh, power that's looming over them. Like some of those themes are without a doubt part I mean, of what he's talking what, about. Here. What is yeah, UHF, no if not Weird Al's version of the Muppet movie? Truly at its core, it's, I mean, as, as goofy as that sounds, as much as I am like Mr. Muppet about stuff, but like that movie is literally a movie about like, as long as you have like a good heart and you chase oh. your dreams and you're creative, like you can storm in into a random office and get a big Hollywood star contract from Orson Welles. Yeah. And like, and, and like, it's got, you know, a, the people have the power message to it as well, yeah. where it's just like, you know, the people united can never be defeated. Yeah. No, it's, well, uh, it's wild. He well, did. It's, yeah. Go ahead, Matt. Sorry. Well, I was going to say, this is why I do recommend anybody who is serious about Weird Al as a songwriter needs to read the book Weird Al seriously, um, where it is like a very sincere academic look at Weird Al songs. Uh, and like Al is interviewed in it and there are definitely points where he's like, well, I've never really thought about my song in that lens, but yes, you're, I guess you're absolutely right that that was like subconsciously happening. And then other times he's just straight up like, yeah, I never thought anyone would pick up on, on like what like, it, it's a very sincere look at his songwriting and the themes of his songs and, and stuff like that in a very interesting way. Uh, so highly recommend it and past guest. Uh, Kelly Phillips did the cover for it. So there you go. There you go. Bring it all you full know, circle. <laughs> it's interesting, Matt, is that Orson Welles' career, though, is like a really sad example of this rich and famous contract going wrong, right? Yes. Like, yeah. like that's why it's so funny that he's the one who offers that contract in the Muppet movie. Yeah. And he, he didn't tell them that at some point they were going to sell wine commercials and shit. That's what's up. Um, <laughs> you know what else is interesting is that. Um, you know, socialism is the idea that the machine is controlled by the state, which is like equally controlled by everyone, right? Decentralized power. 
And when everyone buys the stocks, that's what happens. Interesting example of like capitalism meets socialism and like finally everyone's invested in this, blah, blah, blah. Right. And my dad, my dad's a lawyer, right? So remember we were watching UHF for the first time. My dad was like, stocks can't be distributed that fast. There needs to be a meeting. <laughs> I need to go through this. I'm like, oh man, that can't, that you can't, you can't do it like that. But I thought it was funny. That'd be a pretty boring scene for the movie where yeah, they have to just sit and set waiting. up the meeting to distribute <laughs> stocks. Uh, yeah. But it's like, it's like this movie you know, it's obviously the, the the boring narrative that everyone has is wow, it's really it's really love now. It wasn't then, but that's yeah. because it it predicted a lot of the things that changed. And then YouTube went the other way, right? Because unless you're like Mister whatever the guy is who hands out money and stuff, like it, uh, he gives someone a hundred thousand dollars on the street and he's like, what? Yeah, that? I know what you're talking about. Mr. I don't know the guy's name, Mr. but yeah. Well, I should know that. Mr. You, YouTube's now very centralized. You kind of have to have like a lot of money behind you. But actually, maybe that's not true, but it's harder to break it, right? Mr. Or, Beast? Yeah. Mr. Is that Beast. what we're talking about? Yeah, Mr. Yeah. Beast. Like, yeah, I guess social media is still pretty democratic if you're dope, you know, and if you're yeah. consistent. So, yeah, I, I think if people who talk about how social media ruined everything are people who don't have a lot of followers. <laughs> <laughs> so relaxing. No, people who are like, man, social media changed everything. They forget that, like, you needed a the knack to get you your record deal originally. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's true. I mean, obviously everything's got, you can find the the dark side and the bad side of all things, but yes, no, the, uh, the pre-social media world certainly was not more <laughs> democratic or more of a meritocracy than we have right now. No, it's like people say, man, I missed the fifties. Really? You like that? Like <laughs> gay, gay people were like murdered for being gay. I guess that still <laughs> happens, but like people romanticize the past. You know? Oh yeah, big time, big time. And Even the '90s, you were like, like as someone who was growing up in the '90s, I romanticize it a lot. But then it's like, you know, I look back on it, and you know, you take Rage Against the Machines and Pearl Jam out of the situation. You had a bunch of rock stars who knew that the world was fucked, but their solution was just like watch it burn. You know, what I mean, <laughs> like, like that's kind of the 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 downside of Generation X specifically was that it was like everything's terrible let's be apathetic about it and now we're finally at a generation that's like everything's terrible but let's do the best we can to fix that problem so it's like yeah you, what you a great note to make as we're uh, fast approaching al's 90s era 90s era like it's, it's gonna start there, very soon there isn't an, and like look i am nostalgic for that but there's still a lot of people who didn't have rights back then there's like there is so much stuff that still sucked real bad in the 90s it's also very true. As much as I see it through my rose tinted glasses of like, it was fun listening to the alternative radio by my pool as a kid reading cracked magazine. Like, <laughs> it's, yeah. But it's interesting that Rage Against Machine needed Epic to have their reach. You could only yeah. criticize capitalism on a mass scale if you could, if you were within the capitalist. Yeah, there was no other avenue, right? There was no other way to get your your message out there. Like, and, I, it would be interesting to imagine a group like Rage Against the Machine. If they formed now, and I'm, I, boy, I, my fingers are crossed that a group like that is in the process of forming right now. There's certainly plenty of great punk and you know heavy bands forming. Like, would you take that path? Probably not. I think a lot of younger artists now are are much more aware of the fact that they can have plenty of outreach without going through a major label or a corporate structure of any kind. That's what's up. And you know, it's also interesting. The last thing I have to say about the song is, you know, so the last episode, the good old days I was on, we talked about the Manson story, right? And the Beach Boys. Pigs have always served as like this metaphor for like the bourgeois, right? In the Marxist perspective. And mm -hmm. when Trent Reznor made the downward spiral, he recorded it in the, in the Manson house, right? And then they bought the door from Cielo Drive and put it on the studio in New Orleans. And like, he has all these songs on the downward spiral about pigs in the role and how it reflects like the counterculture perspective on capitalism. And so it's just interesting, like, even though this album came out before the downward spiral, I'm wondering if Trent Reznor heard the song and thought about Manson and said, wow, Al's onto something. Let me do Al's AKE onto something in March of the Pigs. Pigs yeah, exactly. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. All the it's, it, yeah, it's interesting, right? Maybe that was that happened. It's true. Yeah. I mean, like you said, the the pig imagery has been around for a while. That goes back to like, I mean, Pink Floyd did the song Pigs in the 70s. Like that's definitely been a been a thing for a while, but yeah, it's not out of the question. I'm going to assume. I think it's safe to assume that Trent Reznor watched UHF and that was a big inspiration for March of the Pigs. I think so too, and I think also like you know they say pig. we'll get him on the show and we'll talk about yeah. it. We'll we'll get there. He'll come they on say, and talk about germs with us. 
They, oh. that's what's up. <laughs> they say that pigs are, if you ever kill someone, if you have a bunch of pigs, a great way to get rid of the evidence is put them in the pig trough. Uh, pigs will, I have, pigs yes, eat, will uh, eat the entire body real quick. I have heard that before. That's the, that's a good, uh, that's a great strategy. And See, you learn a lot on this show, guys. Yeah. It's an educational <laughs> show. And now what we're going to learn is where we rank this amongst our other Weird Al originals. Um, Matt, are we even going to do this? Are we going to actually rank this? Or are we going to treat this the way we treat it, Gandhi 2 in Fun Zone? Yeah, I mean, I thought... Well, you know, it's so funny. Like, I, I, I thought we had said that we probably were not going to rank this compared to because it's again, I'm looking at the list and it's just hard to imagine like how you compare this this piece of music to uh, cable TV to so many of these other songs. <laughs> I, I don't know how to do it. And I, I same as I said about like Gandhi too, is like it just feels unfair because I feel like I would put it really low just by default. Yeah. What do you think, Lars? Does this song deserve to be ranked against? all of Al's other original songs, or is it more of a of a standalone outlier? Like, it's not a sket, a sketch. Like we said, Gandhi 2 is more like a sketch than a song. Uh, mm-hmm. It's not a sketch. And we said no to Fun Zone because there's technically no Al actually on it. It's just an instrumental. Right. Um, I, I think you 100% have to rank it, and I think you should rank all the skits too. And if they're low, <laughs> they're low. It's a Weird Al album. It's like if you did, <laughs> I'm just saying, I don't know. It seems like you're doing this really academic, obsessive, weird podcast. So why be like very precious about what or what isn't ranked? <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. You've it sold seems, me. It I'm, seems you, exhausting because then you're like, well, Carnival the Animals. Duh, 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 but what about his one? Duh, 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 duh. It's just it's, it's a weird album record. So just maybe all these songs are at the bottom. For, but well, after, we did. Yeah. We did rank the uh, Peter and the Wolf record. Okay. We we did rank yeah, that compared just to not the, rest. the individual right. tracks or anything. I, I've 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 been sold on it. We will uh, we will rank. Uh, I, I will rank this. Okay, I will I'm, also I'm, rank it. Um, where, do you know where you're? Lars has convinced me with his incredible analysis of this piece. No, I mean that, that it's just I, I I don't know if anyone's ever talked about this song as much as we have today, and I'm very grateful. And we covered so much other ground. We 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 talked about MacGuffins, and. <laughs> People, this is, and, and cultural Marxism, like this is one of the most educational, uh, is almost as educational as Peter and the Wolf, where we had to learn about uh, Soviet era classical <laughs> music for children. Um, oh, that ties right. into Marx. Hey, there you go. Right. It's all like these these ideas are there. You y'all, really grab hate, them. y'all really hate money for nothing. Jeez, I'm looking at the list. Well, that's the guest ranking. That's the guest ranking. That wasn't rankings. us. That's, we that didn't has that. nothing to do with us. I see. I see. Uh, I see. So no, I'm a, I'm a fan of money for nothing. So I uh, I'm putting this higher than I thought I would actually. Let me be your hog is located between I'll be mellow when I'm dead and happy birthday. Ooh, better me. than happy birthday. See that this is this is great now. This is like impossible <laughs> to not have a hot take with a song like this. Okay, I'm gonna put it. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna put it uh, again, pretty close to the bottom. But it's not any judgment on this song. I'm gonna put it in between, uh, just below cable TV, and just above one of those days. All right, fair enough. Lars, we sent you the list of the guest rankings. Yeah, I put it Where- below King. King of Suede before girls just want to have lunch. Okay. Lars, we're not done with you just yet because you got one more thing you get to do. You can move a song to a different space on the board. On uh, the guest uh, the guest ranking? Yeah. If you think that a song is too low or too high, you can maneuver it. That's what's up. Wait, let me ask you a question though, real quick. Why did he not release uh, Laundry Day? Did Offspring say no or he just felt like it wasn't a strong concept? You know, Keep the- I don't know. I I've always wondered that. So that's going to be uh, when we get to Bad Hair Day. I am very curious about the Laundry Day because it man, might have just been because it was a little. Was that an older song at the time? No. I don't, yeah, I actually have no. It, it would have been a recent hit because yeah. he wound up obviously doing Pretty Fly for a Rabbi later. Um, that was on the that was on the Bad Hair Day tour and um, Come Out and Play was like summer of '04, so it was two years old, but it wasn't yeah. that old. Mm, mm. That's a good I mean, question. I don't know. I mean, yeah, I was my say, understanding... Smash came out the same time as Dookie, and he was still right. ending ending the polka on that album right. with with a uh, basket case. So my understanding is some of the live parodies were just ones where he had like a verse and a chorus, and just didn't quite know how. Yeah, to just never got get finished. the whole thing, and was like, "Well, this is I can do a portion of it, um, 
But uh, I haven't heard Laundry Day in such a long time. I actually don't know if that's like a full parody or if it's incomplete. It's like it's incomplete. But or or yeah. or Dr. Seuss's estate won't approve it. That also happens. When yeah, it's possible. Parodies. Yeah, yeah. It could have been some some legal issue that uh, that he just hit a wall and was like, forget it. OK, so I get to move one down or up. On yep, this? You can yeah. move it wherever you want on the list. Well, good old days is going to go to four. One more minute is going to five. Ha. <laughs> All right, you know, I, you know how I feel about that song. Uh, yeah, I love. I, I meant to say it at the top of the episode, but when we released the good old days episode with you, at least somebody on our social media—I can't remember where it was or who said it—but somebody was like, "MC Lars should just be the third host of this show," and I definitely <laughs> feel that way more and more as we continue to have you on. Because boy, are you incredibly knowledgeable on this stuff, and <laughs> uh, and so so fun to talk to. Thank you, man. That's what's up. Remember I was talking about my friend's tragic death on Halloween and stuff? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I was tight. People love that stuff, man. <laughs> it's That's sad, good though. content. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's sad, but it's No, you're you're coming you're coming for real. You show up prepared and you got you got great things to say always. You, you know what? You did such a good job. I feel like you're gonna be back very, very soon on this podcast. Yeah, I don't if know. I were, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> if I if I were like <clears throat> running a college or some sort of a higher education institute i would give you a class a semester long class on let me be your hog just based on this episode i think you have like conservatively hours more to say about it i think people <laughs> listening to this episode now could go through what you said and pause it second by second to do research on all of the bullet points that you brought up <laughs> and they'll their lives will be enriched having done so can I, Matt? That's so sweet. Thank you. That's so cool. I want to. Can I move one more point about cultural Marxism before we drop the mic? I would love it if you Absolutely, did. Absolutely. So, please. like, there's two versions of cultural Marxism, right? Like, there's the Frankfurt School where they're like, "This is why Hegel's dialectic was never manifested." And then you have like pundits like Tucker Carlson who like say cultural Marxism is the erase erasing of history. So if you take Splash Mountain and make it the, the Frog Prince Princess and the Frog Ride at Disneyland, that's cultural Marxism because you're erasing our nation's history. And so they use it as a way to defend racism. And I think when you talk about like how things can be co-opted, that's a philosophical term that's been misunderstood. And I think the right wing pundits need to listen to let me be your hog and realize that they're using that term wrong. I just want to say that because it's like inappropriate for them to try to like excuse Confederate flags under the guise of, well, if you take them away, Lenin wins. No, he lost because he had a super big fan who was into the centralization of his apartment at the Dakota. Yeah, dark joke. There you go. But they- <laughs> I appreciate it. Well, Lars, before we do let you go, where can people go to check out more of this stuff? If they just want to hear more about Lars and the music you're making and the podcasts that you're recording and everything else, what is what is the centralized spot for them to find all that stuff? Thanks, thanks for asking, Matt. Thanks for asking, Matt. MCLars.com, baby. That's what's up. All right. Well, we'll be back next week with more uh, of the UHF and other stuff soundtrack.
You're listening to the Geekscape Network.